Uh, ben Shapiro, thank you for coming to GW. Uh, my name is Pranay, I'm a freshman here, um, and full disclosure, I am a socialist. Um, and so, uh, so much for the tolerant right. Um, I, so my question well, I mean, is about- you're here, right? I mean, like, <laughs> uh, so we'll my part, treat you well, don't worry. So my question is, I've seen your videos, I've seen you at other universities here talking about the immorality of socialism, and when you do, you focus on socialism as the idea of wealth redistribution, of, you know, taking from the rich, giving to the poor, taking from whoever, giving to whoever. But what, but I think that ignores and that misses the point of what many socialists, myself and many of my comrades, see socialism as being. And in fact, what we see as integral, um, the debate of whether or how, how much to redistribute wealth is a separate debate altogether, but the fundamental tenet of socialism is control of the means of production by the workers. The idea that a worker is entitled to the full product of their labor. Uh, this is manifested in the real world in the example of worker cooperatives, employee-owned businesses, and so on. So, Setting aside any notions of wealth redistribution, someone already asked about that, what is so immoral about believing that a worker is entitled to the full value of their labor, um, especially given that such a, the enterprises organized in such a way have been shown to be more effective than traditionally capitalistically uh, organized businesses? Okay, so I think we have to separate out a couple of strands there. Number one, if you're gonna talk about the efficacy of of workers owning the means of production. Are we talking about the government owning the means of production or are we talking about workers owning the means of production? Because if you're talking about the government, that is wildly untrue, the last statement that you just made that it's effective. When the government owns the means of production, generally everything blows. Okay, that, that's, that's actually the story of Cuba, that is the story of Venezuela. The, the democratic socialist countries of Norway are generally not owned, except, well, Norway is an exception in which the government owns a lot of stock in various companies, but those companies are run along free enterprise lines. They're not run along redistributionist lines, actually. Uh, and they also happen to have a massive sovereign oil wealth fund. But if you look at countries like, like Denmark, for example, there's still enormous private ownership of business. This is true in most of the, uh, most of the Nordic and, and Scandinavian countries, anyway. Uh, and when you, if, if you're talking about you know, workers owning a business together, and for, I mean, I am a worker at my company. I own my business with another person who owns the company with me, and a couple of investors. The investors have sunk their labor which they made money from, right? Money is just, a, is just a tangible trade for labor. And they took that money and they invested it in us. So I'm lo like, is Bill Gates not a worker at his own company? He invented the company. So I'm, I'm, and, and I'm also wondering how the worker is not owning his own labor when he freely chooses to alienate that labor in exchange for pay. Like, it, it, the, my problem with socialism is, is that it is essentially somebody subjectively deciding the value of your own labor. The beautiful thing about the free market is that you don't get to subjectively decide what your labor is worth, right? You can't go major in something useless and then come to me and say, I want $100,000 a year for my useless major so I can dig holes in the ground, right? That's, that'd be, and we, we all recognize that's stupid. But the, la the labor value of theory, uh, which is, I mean, the, the, um, the uh, value labor of theory, I'm, it's been a long day. Uh, the, 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 um, the labor, yes, the labor theory of value, my goodness. Uh, the labor theory of value, which is that the amount of work you put into something dictates the value of the thing, is a bunch of crap. Right? If I spend all day making mud pies outside, that's an awful lot of work. It's also completely useless. The way that you actually determine the value of work is by trading it for somebody else's work in a fully voluntary fashion. So if you're asking whether I'm okay with, for example, private sector unions, workers get together and they go to the owner and they say, we want more of the profit margin. Sure, as long as you're not kneecapping somebody. Right? But if you kneecap somebody, then I don't approve of your means anymore. If you're asking me if a bunch of workers decide to get together and form a joint stock corporation, of course, that's how most corporations are formed. Most LLCs are formed this way. It's a couple of guys who get together, band their labor together. It's like two guys. And then after it grows, they decide to hire other people. So we, we need to be very specific. When you talk about the, the ownership of the means of production, are you talking about my version? Because that's called capitalism. Or are you talking about where the government owns the means of production? And or crams down on voluntary associations' rules as to the means of production. Uh, if I may, I'm actually I'm talking about about neither. Um, I don't I reject state socialism personally. What I'm referring to is specifically, for example, the term given to worker cooperatives. The most prominent example, the Mondragon Corporation in Spain, owned the the uh, there is no investor or cap like capitalist group that pro owns the profits. When the company turns a profit, that profit is distributed among the workers, some 80,000 employees. It's a wildly successful corporation. I mean, is it a voluntary association? Is there any cram down happening? No, there's not. Then good, but it's capitalist. That's not, that's not, that's not socialist. <laughs> it's not. That's, 
That's free, that's free market That's simply not what capitalism is, though. The term capitalism was coined in the 1850s by a French socialist named Louis Blanc. Right, as, as, as a derogatory, as a derogatory is. term. Right, I should actually use the term free market. It's a free market system when voluntarism is associated with right. it. Right, so that, so that assumes that markets are unique to capitalism, that capitalism has the sole claim on markets, when no, when no one has... No, no, You're not I'm, arguing for anything that is non -viol that violates any single prescription of free markets that I've laid forth. So I'm so I'm wondering, if we're just arguing over, you're saying that my free market terminology is actually socialist terminology, then we're arguing over semantics. What is it about what I have said that you actually don't like? I'm still wondering. All right. Well, what I don't like about what you've said, I believe it's intellectually dishonest for you to cl lay unequivocal claim. Um, f for capitalism on the market system and simply say, all right, that's it. I believe that's intellectually dishonest. I think it misrepresents what socialism is. There's not is. a and single you... theorist of markets who would disagree with a single proposition that I've laid at the roots of what markets are. Not one. Okay, there's not one. And, they, I, I, and your redefinition of socialist to mean free markets where workers are participating in a free market is bizarre to me. I mean, and it, is also, it also runs wildly anti, frankly, the basic texts of Marxism like the Communist Manifesto which requires massive government cram downs, guild organizations at the behest of government, ownership of the means of production crammed down by a massive system up top. Right? I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm having trouble, basically what you're saying to me is that I say a bunch of things are free market, you say no, they're socialist. And I mean, I think first of all, that terminology would be delusional, but second of all, even if that's the case, what if, I, what if I just said to you, fine, okay, now I'm a socialist and you agree with me. You know who else are socialists? All the Republicans out there who agree with every basic thing that you just said. If they call themselves socialists, will you vote for them? Okay, but Republicans simply do not. Uh, uh, do you still agree haven't that. told me what you disagree with that I've said. You just say that you don't like that I, I call free markets free disagree. markets. When you say, <laughs> all right, um, when you say the word socialism, you paint this red scare bogeyman of something that's going to come and uh, come and like, crush our individual freedom. They call themselves the Soviet Republic. Right, and North Korea calls itself the Democratic People's Republic. Nomenclature doesn't mean anything without, if it's not backed up by, su by su uh, substantial fact. And what I'm trying to say is that, um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that when you say socialism, but you're referring to very specifically state socialism, wherein the government nationalizes all industry, all business, you say that is socialism, that is bad, ergo socialism is bad. It ignores the nuances of what socialism is. That's like saying, for example, Christianity. There are a million different strains, different different strands, different sects. That I know. I'm not asking. I'm not asking. I'm not asking about a million strains of socialism. I'm asking. I have just told you that all of the things that you talked about, workers getting together and organizing their own company and dividing the profits among them equitably as they see fit, that that is. I'm telling you that that doesn't violate the prescriptions of the free market. So I don't see the problem with it. And you're telling me that you disagree with me. Of the free market, but it does violate the prescriptions definitionally of capitalism. Again, given that capitalism was defined as a derogatory term, capitalism was defined by Louis Blanc and others. So, are you saying that companies should not be able to have investors? I'm not saying that companies shouldn't be able to have investors, but my, okay, let's give a specific, a more specific example. Let's say uh, Milton Friedman had his example of the pencil, right? So, let's say you own a pencil factory. I'm a worker in that pencil factory. You can have all the machinery, all, you can buy all the raw materials you want, but without me and presumably many others like me to assemble the pencils, all you would have is a pile of wood, yellow paint, graphite, rubber, and aluminum. Okay. That would be worth it. So, and that is worth less than the pencil when you try and sell it. And yet all of that value added by labor, apart from the wages that you give me, which if we're being honest, there is a major power imbalance in our ability to negotiate that. Well, if, if, all you, if all that putting the pencil together requires is basic use of your prefrontal cortex, then yes, your labor is alienable at lower rates than if you are a doctor. That's not the fault of the person who owns the machinery. But if, all, but if, the, but if you didn't have workers like me and your pencil factory and you were just one man... But I so do. I have millions of people who are willing to do that voluntarily for me. And, you know what? Sorry, guys. I want, to, I want to finish the conversation so we can cut the applause for now until we finish the conversation, then we'll all applaud at the end. It'll be great. So, <laughs> we'll go on for like a couple more minutes with this and then we have to move on. What, 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 I'm, saying is, uh, what, what I'm saying is that, yes, we are, um, 
What, 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 I'm, what I'm saying is that if you're just one person trying to asse like assemble pencils, you're not going to get very far. You need workers. Capital needs labor infinitely more than labor needs capital. That's why you have worker cooperatives where the workers I are the I fundamentally ones disagree on the distinction between capital and labor. Capital is just a term for money. If you're talking about money, money does not grow from the ground. Money only has value because it was traded for labor at one point or the products of labor. So if I take my money and I buy machinery, I have invested my labor in doing that because I didn't get the money from nowhere. Even if I got it from my parents, my parents didn't get the money from nowhere. The people who built the machines required me to trade something of value to them in order for me to obtain the machines. The people who invented the machines required people to pay them in order to get the, the patent to that machine so they could build the machine. The, the, the problem that I'm seeing in, in what you're saying is you have still failed. If, if what you're talking about is a system of voluntarism, you still have not named any area in which we disagree, and yet you're telling me that you're a socialist and I'm a free marketer. So one of us has got this wildly wrong, and I'm pretty sure it's not me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is because what I'm saying is, uh, again, uh, again, under ca under capitalism, where we are in this employer-employee relate. Well, when I say the word capital, I refer I mean, to I mean, the owners. I don't mean to be mean, but you thought that was a nice shirt too. Um, but it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I could I couldn't help myself. That was mean. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I used to own a shirt just like that, and then my wife made me throw it out. <laughs> Your wife's a doctor, right? Was that? Your wife's a doctor, right? Just she is sure. indeed. You haven't mentioned it yet. Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, so what, what I'm saying one is... More, one more and then, we'll, and then we'll go to the next person. The differentiation I draw, and I'm not alone in this, I'm not one person trying to redefine anything. The differenti differenti differentiation I and many others like me draw between socialism and capitalism is that under capitalism, when you as the owner of the factory you give me a wage. The wage could be seven twenty-five. it could be $15, it could be whatever an hour, right? right? But you, you give me a wage, all all the additional profit above the, uh, made from selling the pencils or whatever good you produce above what is reinvested into the company ultimately goes to you or the investors, the, uh, it goes who own shares in the means of production. Right. Under socialism, those people are the workers. And the example I give, again, is cooperative enterprise. No, those are the people who are investing the risk. So if they carry the risk, then they get the benefit. The owner of the factory carries the risk, therefore he gets the benefit. The workers in the company you mentioned, if that company were to go bankrupt, they would carry the risk as well as the benefit. If the company goes bankrupt, and this guy has to pay off all of his debts, the worker may lose his job, but he's not the one who's going to incur the debt of having gone bankrupt. If you incur risk, then you're the one who pays the downside. The worker does not pay the downside. Okay, it is the investor who pays the downside, who invested in all the machinery, who sunk millions of dollars into making your labor productive. Because guess what your labor is without that machinery? Gunk, nothing. You don't have a pencil to put together, you don't got the wood, you don't got the, you don't got the paint, you don't got the rubber, you don't got the metal, you got nothing. Right? You're sitting there, standing outside, twiddling your thumbs. It required somebody to invest, mil who do you think put more in? The guy who spent millions of dollars buying all the machinery, leasing the place, making sure there was a management structure, doing the LLC formation, making sure all the tax code was in compliance, or you standing outside because you can stick a piece of graphite into a piece of wood? <laughs> now we're done. Okay. Sorry, we could go on and make this all night. So this will be our last question. No pressure to follow that up. But. Um, first, I want to thank you, since I'm last question, apparently, uh, for coming out here, taking the schlep all the way out from the West Coast. We really appreciate it. Um, and my question for you is, like you, I am a very proud American Jew, and I support both the United States and Israel very strongly. But I also acknowledge, and as I'm sure you do, that there are very serious issues with both the United States and Israel. So with that being said, I want to know what your greatest criticism of either Israeli domestic or foreign policy is. Well, Israel's economy is a mess. Uh, it's, it's productive, but only because they have great intellectual capital in Israel. Uh, the, the restrictions on labor there are insane. The restrictions, on the, the tax code in Israel is unworkable. Uh, they, they lose an enormous number of good workers every year to other places where people feel like they can make a living better. So that, that, that's the biggest problem with, with the governance of Israel. It lives in a dangerous area of the world. It has to do what it has to do in order to protect itself. But what I see is that they have tremendous internal problems also because there's broad disagreements about you know, what you owe in terms of military service from certain sectors. Of, uh, as an Orthodox Jew, I think that there should be universal military service in Israel that includes Orthodox Jews and people who study in Yeshivot, for example. That's a controversial proposition in, in many parts of the, the community to which I belong. Um, you know, th those, are, those are a few issues that exist in Israel. As far as the issues that exist in America, I think that the key issue is the one that I discussed earlier, as far as a crisis of, of definitions, a crisis of the soul. Barack Obama said in his second inaugural address, one of the most astonishing things I've ever heard a politician say, he said in 2012 that the 
definition of liberty was fungible. He basically said that we don't all have to define liberty in the same way in order for us to agree uh, to live with each other. And at a root level, that's just not true. You actually do have to define liberty in the same way if you wish to live in the same country together. If your definition of liberty is that you get to tell me I can't go to my church or I can't send my kids to a religious school, then your definition of liberty is not, in fact, liberty. It's cram downs on me. If you define certain basic terms the same way, liberty would be a fundamental one. Duty would be a pretty good one. You know, certain systems of virtue would be a pretty good one, but we disagree on all of these basic terms, and that's where I see the social fragmenting happening. And I think that in the absence of any sort of social fabric, what we've seen is people just beating the living hell out of each other on a political level on questions that we can have, you know, nice conversations about all the way.